Hello everybody, my name is kgreen829 and welcome to the AAC wrap up show. It is currently Friday night, it's like 11pm right now, uh, but I am recruiting, recording this episode because all of the games are done. We only had one, we had one Thursday game and we had five Friday games, nothing on Saturday, so I'm recording it and then once we do recruiting, I'm just going to do a quick addendum, you know, a little video just to catch us up on recruiting so we don't miss out on that. Uh, we had a lot of good games that we'll get to, but before I get to them, uh, just a quick disclaimer, I have fixed the audio fading on my mic. Um, in doing so, though, uh, I found it was a problem with the filters that I was adding to the mic to make uh, audio quality, um, you know, a little bit better. So without those, you know, audio quality might be a little bit worse. So if that is the case, let me know. Um, and I can look into, you know, some more filters that'll make it better that don't introduce the audio fading. Um, but other than that, I'm ready to get into these uh, matchups. And we start off with a good one. Charlotte at East Carolina. And you might be wondering why this is a good one. It's two teams that are 4-5. and five, But something that I really do like about this matchup is with the conference realignment happening next year, this is a little bit of a preview of a future AAC matchup as Charlotte will be one of the teams joining the AAC um, you know, they get a good look at the AAC, and the AAC gets a good look at them here on Thursday, the only Thursday game of the week for the AAC, um, and it started off pretty calm, you know, first quarter, you know, playing good defense, 0-0, and the first half ends with a 6-0 East, East Carolina win. East Carolina ends up, um, you know, really turning on the Jets in the second half, and ends up winning 23-17, to but, I mean... Let's go over this real quick, because this is our first look at Charlotte, who is going to be the newest, one of the newest additions to the AAC. So let's just go through and do a quick scouting report on them. Ryan Trowick, quarterback, 14 for 29, 119 yards, a touchdown, and an interception. Did much better than Rivero, who, was, who is, of course, the quarterback for East Carolina, who only completed nine passes on 17 attempts for 47 yards. Uh, Rivero is known for using his legs. Uh, so he got 18 yards and 191, 18 attempts, 191 yards on those 18 attempts and a touchdown. And the backup, Ryan Gobert, had a great game, 16 attempts and 148 on those attempts. But how did Charlotte fare on the ground? Well, they seem to be a pretty solid force when it comes to running on the ground. And that's led by Ryan Trawick, the quarterback himself. Eight, rush, eight attempts for 88 yards, no touchdowns. Starting running back, uh, Jamal Jordan. Had 18 rushing attempts, but only was able to put together 77 rushing yards. So, a bit of a struggle there, but uh, Tar Trawick is showing that he's an athlete and he can pick up yards through the air or on the ground. So, that's something to pay attention to and see if they try to incorporate that into their offense next year. Uh, you know, obviously we don't know who the quarterback's going to be. And uh, this is me without, like, going through and checking, you know, what year these people are in. So I'm just assuming that they're coming back next year. Next uh, person of note, Ryan London, wide receiver for Charlotte. Eight targets, five catches for 73 yards, and a touchdown. If he is not a senior, if he stays here, he's going to be somebody that you should keep your look to keep your eyes on because that matchup between him and Trawick could be deadly if given time. Um, not too much to go on other than that. Uh, you know, Pretty vanilla game. Charlotte never kicked a field goal and made their extra point. ECU, 2 for 2 on the extra points and 3 for 3 on field goals. Pretty solid, uh, pretty ordinary game. And uh, yeah, that's it for the Friday. That's it for the Thursday games. But next up, we move to Friday. And Friday had a, a lot of good games and a lot of good results. We had every single, um, we had, we had every single game, if I believe it. Every single AAC Friday game was broadcasted live with Sim FBA live, and oh boy, was it, it, it was a run of AAC game after AAC game, and this action was really good. Uh, first, let's get to USF at Memphis. USF coming off of a, you know, a big win. Um, you know, against against uh, Missouri, playing Memphis, who you know, after last week's loss, dropped to in my rankings the worst team in in the conference, and 
I guess Memphis took offense because after being shut out in the first half and being down 7 nothing, Memphis would go on to have the perfect third quarter, putting up 28 points, allowing zero, and with both teams blanking each other in the fourth, Memphis gets a 28-7 to comfort-behind upset win. This win was led by quarterback Brian Holsey, 25 completions on 42 attempts for 226 yards, 3 touchdowns, and 4 interceptions. What you got to know about this game it was it was a defensive battle because Memphis had f- threw four interceptions. You look at the other side, side, USF's quarterback Kyle Higby also threw for four interceptions. 12 completions, 25 attempts, 117 yards, and one touchdown. So Holsley had the much better game, but defense was a big focus. And, I mean, you want to look, that's eight turnovers already. But then Eddie Johnson, uh, one of the running backs for USF, fumbled the ball. Ryan Forbes, a wide receiver for Memphis, fumbled the ball. Um, you put that together, that's 10 turnovers. This is a game that had 10 turnovers. There were more turnovers in this game than points by USF. Um, this was, you know, if this was a very exciting game. Memphis really put it all together in the fourth in the third quarter and was able to hold on and get the win. Great win for that program. A team that's been starved, starved for a win for a pretty long time. No other, like, incredible notices. Um, Holsey... Uh, did a great job, and he was spreading the ball out. Only comment is those four interceptions is something he needs to work on, and he needs to clean up a little bit. Next up, we have Houston at Navy. And this game was another good one. Benny Ramirez, quarterback for Navy, was the, I mean, the offense centered around him. For Navy, at least 27 completions, 43 attempts, 292 yards, and two touchdowns, and zero interceptions. But Houston, not to be outdone, also put up a very solid and impressive, an impressive um, air raid offense with 18 completions, 31 attempts, 273 yards, no touchdowns, but zero interceptions for either of them. But it's that's that's more of a surprise. You you don't expect Houston to do much through the air. What you expect them to do is you expect them to kill them on the ground with their new weapon, and both teams, both teams put a lot of investment on getting the running game started on the offense. Look at Navy, who they split their carries between their top two backs, Donald Perkins and and former quarterback Alberto Martin. Perkins had 24 attempts for 194 yards and a touchdown, and Alberto Martin had 20 attempts for 88 yards and a touchdown. So great rushing attack by Navy. But then we come up to somebody who, if he played this position all year, could have been, you know, a very strong, could have made a very strong case for Heisman and may still be making a, and is still making a really strong case that maybe he should be looked at for AAC Player of the Week. And that is former quarterback turned running back Devontae Doyle, who on 26 attempts put up 252 nines. 252 yards, that's 9.69 yards per carry, and four touchdowns. Doyle was the offense for this Houston team, and it was a good game. You know, maybe Houston going blow for blow, 10-14 Houston up at the end of the first quarter. Then by a 10-point second quarter for Navy, has them going into halftime with a 20-17 to lead. In the third and fourth quarter, both teams put up seven as Navy comes away with a narrow upset win, winning 34 to 31 at home. This was a this was a great game, uh, really. And I mean, like I said, Navy finds the most success when their passing game is working and when their receivers are making catches. And Wes Asuna made sure that happened. On 18 targets, made 13 catches for 169 yards. Did not get a touchdown, but uh, the yards and spreading the yards was crucial in spreading out the offense, and it made a big, big impact, and was a big reason that um, Navy was able to get the win. Um, and you even look just to show how close this game was. Okay, like Memphis, Houston had the ball, and they had to punt it away with uh, seven minutes twenty four left, and on a drive with five minutes and three seconds left. Navy scores the game-winning touchdown, and they're able to hold on to that for the rest of the game. It was a it was a great game to watch um, live. Uh, lots of excitement. Two great teams going blow for blow. Uh, 
unfortunate thing is that one team had to lose, and that team was Houston. Uh, this this game, if it if it's possible, this game should have had two winners. Both teams deserve to win this game. Both teams played great. Um, next up, we have Cincinnati at SMU. Like I said, Cincinnati's been sliding. SMU's got I'm trying to start trending in the right direction, and they keep that up, getting allowing six points in the first half. SMU shuts the door and puts up 17 in the second half to get a 17 to 6 win. Tyler Graham, quarterback for SMU, put up um interesting numbers. 35 completions, 62 attempts, which is insane, but only getting 348 yards and one touchdown. Through four interceptions though. So it was not I will say it was not the prettiest game for SMU. They threw four interceptions in this game but you know down six to start the second half down six nothing to start the second half graham put up a great performance um and it you know came from his connection with jake greenberg who got, had a who on 11 targets had seven catches for 152 yards running game wasn't too big of a factor in this game despite cincinnati trying hard to get sir anthony dudley involved with 32 attempts he was only able to pick up 81 yards um, and you really want to talk about difference makers. Cincinnati missed three field goals. Okay, they missed three field goals. So that's nine points that they left on the board. And that makes it 17-15. Maybe if they convert all three of those field goals, they have the extra push they need to take the win. But when you want to talk about the game, you look down. And, I mean, it was all set up. Uh, SMU is down 3-6 in the fourth quarter and they get the ball back on a punt by Cincinnati and Graham who's been having and Graham who's been having a sorry about that if Gra Graham who's been having a tough game decides that he's going to come up in the clutch zero yard completion to wide receiver Adam Hansen then fires a bomb to wide receiver Jake Greenberg for 51 yards and then tosses one to running back Sam Carter for an extra 22 Get it, giving them the touchdown that would ultimately win them the game. They score another touchdown late, later in the game with just two minutes, five seconds left to be the nail in the coffin. What a game it was for SMU. They ch put on a show, um, and Cincinnati's uncharacteristic and surprising fall continues. Um, a team that was regarded by most, and even me, as you know, a contender for the conference championship game, was my pick to make the conference championship? Was my number two, in, number two or number three in the AAC starting this season? Now falls to five and five. Um, just terrible results that we've seen recently from Cincinnati. Moving on, we get to another good game, and this game was one of the more hyped up games. This game was the most hyped up game going into this into this slate. And that's Temple at Tulane. Let's set the stage a little bit, though. Tulane's 6-2 and two going into this game, and Temple's 5-4. and four. Tulane, with coming off of a loss to Houston last week, needs to bounce back. But extra incentive for them to win. A Tulane win combined with a UCF um, loss, a, combined with a UCF or USF loss, means that Tulane clenches the bowl game. The, the conference championship game. They've already got a bowl game. They, they, they already secured the bowl game, but that would mean that they clinched the conference championship game. USF already lost, but they, but Tulane does not know this going in, and they, they're they going in. They're going to try and fight their hardest because they still, even though USF lost, t Tulane needs to get a win here um, if they want to clinch it because that would, take temp that would uh, put Temple two games behind and would mean that uh, they that if um that it would pretty much make it so that Tulane would have to lose their next two games, and even if that happened, they would have um you know they would have tiebreakers over Temple, over UCF, and over USF, and they would make the conference championship game. So a win here with a loss by UCF or USF secures the conference championship game. Temple coming off of a great 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 performance where they had two 100 yard receivers 
Um, and this game started off a little lopsided with Tulane putting up 14 points in the first quarter and 21 in the second quarter. Going into halftime, this game was 35-7. to seven. Um, And we had it on blowout watch. Bronson Morrow had tossed four touchdowns. Uh, Alexi Patterson had a big run and was able to put up a touchdown on the ground. Um, and most importantly, that top receiver to, for Tulane, Fernando Thomas, 14 targets, 10 catches, 216 yards, packed to his ways, and two touchdowns. With Travion Love, that number two receiver, 13 targets, nine catches for 126 yards and two touchdowns. And Devontae Pina, who is looking like he will be wide receiver one for this Tulane squad next year on five targets, made three catches for 31 yards, also putting up an impressive performance. Also, Robin Rios, who targeted five times, only made one catch, but it was a good, it was a, it was a great play where he picks up 40 yards. Um, but lots of respect for Temple and their game. Quarterback Levon Levine had a great game. 20 completions for 41 attempts. 300, sorry, 20 completions on 41 attempts. 307 yards and three touchdowns. Um, and then finding Tejon Hecker, his most reliable and best wide receiver. For, oh, looked for him 11 times. They connected seven for 166 yards and two touchdowns. Um, ultimately, a fumble by Hecker would be something that would kind of close out the game for Temple um, and lead to the two-lane win despite them not being able to capitalize. Um, but it was a really hard-fought game, and it was a great game for both of these teams. Um, with the win, Tulane has secured their spot in the conference championship game, advancing to 7-2, and two, and uh, advancing to 7-2 and two, um, in conference... 7-2 and two on the season. Sorry. I don't know why that was so hard for me to get out. But seven and two on the season, um, they are they have the best record in the AAC, um, and have just, have just been a very dominant team. Um, rare, uh, I will say shout out to my kicker Adam Edwards. I always get on him because he sucks, but didn't kick any field goals this week, and he went five for five on extra points. So. Could not evaluate him on field goals, but perfect on extra points. He did his job. Very proud of him. I might call off the dogs on him for like a week or two uh, for that performance. Um, but, you know, great game. Tulane started to fall apart in the second half. Not able to put up much and throwing two interceptions in that half, which um, would be the two interceptions that Morrow had on the game. Uh, but ultimately, Tulane was able to stand tall and secure their win despite the late game heroics from Temple. And finally, we get to the last game of the day and of the week for the AAC. And that is UCF, the number one team in the AAC. I had them as a number one team at Tulsa. Tulsa has been, you know, Tulsa has been picking up momentum. They've been getting some big wins. And this is going, to, they just came off of a big, big win against Kentucky. Um, and... You know, right after that, they're tested again. Tulsa has to... Uh, I, I was I was looking at some things, and going into this game, Tulsa still had a path to the AAC Conference Championship game. They just needed to do... They just needed to win the rest of their games and get lucky by a couple losses. And I'm going to tell you something. Tulsa is fighting for that conference championship game as they take down UCF 33 to 21. It was a great game by Tulsa. Maurice Ekule, 27 completions, 41 attempts for 258 yards and two touchdowns. But Jonathan Levine, um, who keep in mind this UCF team is, you know, they they lean on their defense a lot, and the fact that Tulsa was able to put up 33 is very impressive. I think the best performance um, offensively against UCF before this game was when I played them as Tulane, and I put up 27. Um, so to put up 33 was very impressive um, feat by Tulsa. But UCF, um, you know, at the end of the first half was down 16-7, to and, you know, early in the fourth quarter was down 33-7. to but they scored 14 points to make it close. They just didn't have enough juice to come back. Um, led by Jonathan Levine. 23 completions on 39 attempts for 267 yards. Another two touchdowns, but ha he had one interception. 
Then Steven Herter, that top running back, 28 attempts for 107 yards. Um, and then you look at the re receiving yards. UCF tight end Chris Wilson was the main focus for Jonathan Levine. Uh, got the second most targets, two less than uh, wide receiver Gary Dominguez. Made three less catches, but put up 130 yards and the two passing touchdowns. Just a great, solid game for tight end Chris Wilson. Um, you know, played great. And I'm going to go over. UC UCF missed two field goals, and that could have been, you know, a big difference maker. It wouldn't have effect changed the score, but maybe it could have swung momentum or some extra things to that would have pushed UCF to score some more points. Um, we're going to get into our, So after now that we're done with all the games, we're going to get into the rankings, and then we're going to go to AAC discussion where I usually just talk about schedule. But I'm going to talk... Before I talk about schedule for next week, I'm going to talk about some of the, uh, you know, some of the conference championship game, you know, like paths that teams have. So, um, pulling up the wiki right now, um, because it's, or actually I'll just use the interface, uh, just so I have, you know, a comprehensive list of the conference games. It's not up to date, but I can just add the results from this week. Here are the rankings. Tulane jumps back into number one with their win. Tulsa, after three big wins in a row, jumps up to number two. They've got momentum. They're a good team. They just beat the number one team in UCF. So I have them moving up. UCF moves down to three. Temple losing to um, Tulane. Doesn't take too big of a hit. Only moves down one to four. Navy moves up after a nice win against Houston to five. USF at six. Houston at seven. SMU at 8, East Carolina at 9, Cincinnati at 10, and Memphis at 11. Um, so, some rankings. As you can see, this conference is still very close. Um, and, you know, keep forgetting. I, I was reminded of it today. Con because conference realignment, after this season, we will be losing UCF, Cincinnati, and Houston to the um, Big, tw uh, Big 10 or Big 12. I forget. Uh, either way, they are gone, and um, they're gone after the season. And you know, really disappointing. We're losing. We're losing three really, really good teams. Um, but uh, we are happy to be getting six new additions to the AAC family. Uh, this will all happen ne um, before the start of next season. So, um, cannot wait for that. Uh, it will be fun to start, but we'll miss those teams in a especially Houston, because they are, um, you know, an a Houston is an active team still. The only one that's leaving that is an active team. Uh, so co uh, Coach Merrill can going, leaving the AAC with Houston, um, you know, going to have to make sure to schedule a couple out-of-conference games with him like every once in a while because I uh, really enjoy going up against him. He really, uh, you know, put it together a good game plan against me. Sorry about that, if you saw that, but... Um, like I, yeah, like I was saying, uh, we'll miss those teams. But I uh, got to look forward to the future. We're getting six uh, new additions who hopefully can fill the spotlight. Uh, let's get to the discussion part, and let's look. So after a win this week against Temple, Tulane has clinched the conference championship game. There is one spot left. And if uh, so you can look, and here are my top teams uh, here are my top teams that are still eligible for the conference championship game. There may be more, but these are just the one, like the clearest ones that I see. Um, so, with Tulsa winning, they are officially in the thick of things. Um, they have to win if, if they want to make the conference championship game. They have to win at East. They have to win at home against East Carolina, and then win at Houston. That would make them uh, seven and five in the AAC, um, and or sorry, sorry, that will make them uh, seven and two in the AAC, um, and with the loss by UCF, temp, or sorry, sorry, my bad. Let me start over. So Tulsa getting those next two wins again at home against East Carolina and at Houston will make them. Um, We'll make them seven. Hold on. Yeah. Sorry. 
My brain is not working right now. Let me restart again. I, I apologize for this. Uh, math is uh, not working right now. But I thought I could add, you know, numbers together, you know, simple, like 1 plus 3 plus 1 or whatever. But clearly that's a problem for me. Here we go. Tulsa, after a win against UCF, is 4-3 and three in the conference. Getting a win at home against East Carolina and at Houston would make them 6-3. and three. Um, A loss today by UCF, by UCF, Temple, and USF makes makes um all through all four of those teams tied at four and three in the conference a loss this week by east Car- a win by east carolina um technically i think still keeps them um eligible but they need so much uh to make the conference championship game but they need so much to go right it's not even worth talking about them a loss by houston eliminates them from the race for the conference championship game so in my opinion the four teams, there are four teams competing for that last spot. It's Tulsa, UCF, Temple, and USF. And all three, all four of those teams has a claim to it. They all deserve to be in, you know, to, to you know, appear in it and support their conference and go head to head with Tulane um, for a rematch because Tulane's played every game, every team in this conference except for uh, East Carolina this year. But. You look at it, and let's get into the path that Tulsa needs. So, they get two more wins. They Tulsa has to win out if they want to make the conference championship games. Uh, don't think it will be a problem at home against East Carolina, but will be something to watch Week 13 when they go to Houston. That will be a big game for Tulsa. It's going to be a tough game too. Um, but like, look, but if you look at the other ones, UCF and USF play each other Week 13 at USF. So that's a loss for at least UCF and USF. What what Tulsa needs is UCF to win that game at USF. That would elim- um and if Tulsa wins out, a loss to UCF would eliminate USF from the conference championship game. I'm sorry if this gets a little wordy and hard to follow, but uh I, this has all been worked through in my mind, and I understand it, but I understand that other people may not. So Tulsa, so let's just go over it real quick. To make the conference championship game, Tulsa has the hardest route of the people who I say are still in contention. They need to win out a game against East Carolina and a tough game at Houston. Then they need USF and Temple to both drop one more. They need USF, Temple, um, and uh, UCF to all drop one game um, in the next two weeks uh, in their conference. Or actually, no, they need... So UCF... Sorry. Okay, let me start over. Um, I, I, I really do apologize for this. So, just clear your mind of everything I said about conference championship games. This is where we're at for Tulsa making the conference championship game. They need, they need to win out. UCF only has one more in conference game and that's at USF week 13. Tulsa has the tiebreaker over UCF after beating them this week. So they need UCF to take down USF so that so that eliminate that would eliminate USF from bowl contention and they need Temple uh, to either lose they need Temple to lose week 12 at home against SMU because Tulsa lost to Temple. If that happens the only teams that have that are six and three in AAC play are UCF and Tulsa, and Tulsa with the win over UCF this week gets the tiebreaker, and cl- and gets a spot in the conference championship game. That is the biggest. That's the biggest stretch that I say still has a chance of happening. Tulsa is a very talented team, um, and I feel like if um, they controlled their own destiny, they would make the bowl game, but. They need some things to go right. Now let's look at USF. USF, going into this, has to win at Memphis. Or Sorry, sorry. USF has to win at home against Tulane um, this, uh, this next week. They have to win at home against Tulane and then win at home against UCF. If they do both of that... 
then they just need to hope that Temple loses at home to SMU and they make, and then and then USF makes the conference championship game. So USF just needs to win out and needs Temple to lose their last in-conference game at home against SMU. Now, so that's the second most difficult one. Now we're moving up a little bit. And so next up is Temple. Temple's got the second got the second easiest path. They have to win at home against SMU. And and then that's in week 12 and then they're done with their in conference and the fate and the rest of their um the, their conference championship uh, you know their odds to make the conference championship game all comes down to that USF UCF game where they would need UCF to lose to USF. I ideally for Temple USF would also lose to Tulane while that's not um technically necessary it would make things a lot easier going into that game. And UCF has the easiest path to the conference championship game. They just need to win at USF. If they can win at USF, then they, I, I may be wrong about this, but if, if I'm reading this right, if they win at UC, USF week 13, their last in conference game, their last game of the season, they clench the bowl game no matter what happens. And that will set the bowl game as two lane versus UCF. So like I said, four teams still very much in it for that last spot will be interesting as we approach the last three weeks. Um, but that third that third week is you know just for um, just for a special game. So you know Army Navy game, me me going up um, against Air Force. So realistically, there's only two games left. So things are going to get really really interesting. Now let's get to the schedule. This was week 11, and we're going into week 12, and let's go game by game. So, we've got one, sorry, sorry, not one. We have three out-of-conference games this week. First, we have UCF at UTEP. UTEP will be joining the AAC next year, so that will also be, you know, a fun little preview uh, like into what the AAC gets. Um, and one of their new, uh, another one of their new additions, Memphis, is going to go at SJSU, San Jose State, and finally Houston. After a tough, after a huge win to Tulane and a tough loss to Navy, will be at home against home of, you know, future home of qu quarterback recruit Dick Richards BYU. So. That'll be a fun game to watch. Uh, hopefully, Houston can get the win over there, stack up the wins. Because once a uh, once once Dick comes in, I don't know if we're going to be able to get many wins against that team. So those, that's it for the out of conference games. But where things really get interesting is the in conference games. We have East Carolina at Tulsa. So pretty uh, pretty calm, tame game for Tulsa. They should take care of business um the way that they've been playing they should take care of business not calling it a closed game because anything can happen as we saw this week with tons of wild games but uh should be an easy win for tulsa here uh and rooting for them uh for the best i think you know it's better despite me liking ecu and ec as coach uh tulsa as a national champions last year i mean the aac is better when tulsa's better so i have a hard time rooting against tulsa um Next up, we have Navy at Cincinnati. Big win against Houston for Navy. They're going up against a team that's been falling a lot. While they're while they are at home, Navy can get a big win at Cincinnati. And doing that, I mean, that'll put them at four wins. And if, I'm telling you, if that happens, if Navy wins, they got two more games after that, and they could end the season bowl eligible. If they win at Cincinnati and if they win at SMU, the Army-Navy game in Week 14 is Navy playing for their bowl game lives. They would because they would need to win at win against Navy in the Army-Navy game to secure a bowl game. So that will be very interesting. I'm really hoping for that because that would be a cool storyline and that's especially cool to see uh, Navy bounce back and make a bowl game after a very bad start to the season. 
next up, um, we have at SMU at Temple. Temple with a tough loss, and SMU with a really good win uh, are going to go head-to-head. SMU is going to see if they can keep things rolling, um, and Temple is going to see if they can bounce back because they were in— uh, if they had, a, if they got a win against Tulane, they were in the driver's seat of the AAC and controlled their own destiny in terms of making the conference championship game. With that loss, things are now a little bit, are now a little bit more up to fate. So they need to get a win at home against SMU if they even want to think about making a bowl game. Then we have, um, then we have Tulane at home against USF. Um, wait, hold on. I'm double checking where this is because in the schedule it doesn't have either team, it doesn't have USF or Tulane at home. So I'm just double checking where this game is. Okay, so yeah, that is an away game. That game is at USF. So Temple, or sorry, Tulane at USF. And then finally, actually, no, not finally. That, those are the games. So a lot of interesting things. Um, and, I mean, with it, we could see UCF, despite playing an out-of-conference game, UCF can clench. Uh, no, 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 they can't. They, they, uh, can't. we can see, actually, yeah, so we can see Tulsa, sorry about this. We can the gears are working in my brain. We can see Tulsa and Temple eliminated from the conference championship game this next week. And the last spot will all come down to that UCF at USF game um, in week 13. So it will be fun to watch. That's all I have for now. Keep in mind, uh, I will post... Uh, I, I'm not going to post this tonight because it's too late. I'll post it tomorrow, though. Uh, so you guys can relive the a the uh, action, uh, spelled with two A's, um, the action of the of today, um, tomorrow. Uh, but then after recruiting's done on Sunday night, I will record a quick video re recapping recruiting in the AAC and get that out there. So thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Uh, and I will see you guys uh, in a couple of days for that recruiting recap, and then I will see you next week. So, uh, you know, like I said, very, and just, you know, si before I end, like I said, AAC is getting very interesting down the stretch. So keep your eyes on this conference because there is some big storylines going into the last couple weeks of this, of this season. Thank you for listening. I've been K Green 829, your host, uh, and I'll see you guys in a couple days. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the AA to the AAC show. Um, I forgot to actually post um, the uh, you know show. I was going to post the show, then post another show, you know, a little recruiting wrap up uh, video, but forgot to post it. So when, at the time, I finally realized that I forgot to post it. It was so close to recruiting that I decided to just wait it out. I'll just add it on to the end to the same video. So. Um, let's get into this, um, let, let's get into this. So, we had three commitments again, um, uh, and, excuse me, um, I'm looking at, I'm looking at some, um, one of these, so, alright, so let's get into this. We have three commitments, and it's three classes that have been making moves in these last couple weeks and have really been, you know, really been, you know, adding a lot of talent to their draft class and th to the, not the draft class, sorry, really adding a lot of talent to their recruiting class. And this week was no different. We started off with Tulsa, who's been making, who's been grabbing a lot of guys recently and has been looking really good. And they keep that momentum going by grabbing a commit with 40% odds. It's strong safety. Frederick Thoreau, man coverage guy, four stars, B overall, B potential, out of Macedonia, Ohio, went to Nord Nordonia High School, um, and this is just, I mean, this is a player who can, who can play, I mean, just, 
I, there's not really another way to put it. Um, it's just this is somebody who, you know, he's produced before, um, and while he's not the most engaged in academics, he does enough to scrape by. Uh, so that's not his game, but he can really play football. Uh, you know, not often you see a lot of top football players coming out of Ohio, but Thoreau is one of the top safeties in the league. Um, I mean, he even has a, uh, he has a case to be the top safety, the top strong safety, at least the top strong safety in this recruiting class. Um, since there are no five stars, five star strong safeties, there's two, uh, there's no five star strong safeties. There's some free safeties. But the only there's only three uh, four star strong safeties and uh, B overall B potential. He's tied with uh, Gregory Bellamy who went to TAMU with B overall B potential and ahead of Luis Barosilis who has B overall and C potential who went to Baylor. So he has a case for the best strong safety in the class. Huge commitment for Tulsa, getting a really big, you know, a really big addition to that defense and. I'm having trouble pulling up their class right now, so I won't have their class available to go over, but I will have the class for another team to go over when we get to them. But we're not moving on from Tulsa just yet, because they got another guy, and that's Pagan... I'm going to butcher this. Paganj... Paganj Gao, okay? Run blocking, offensive tackle, four stars, B overall, C potential. This guy is, you know, just again, another player taken away from Notre Dame 56 57% odds to commit to Tulsa 43 to commit to Notre Dame and Tulsa gets the commitment he's from Plainfield Iowa um he's from Plainfield Iowa and you know not too much to say about him except just another solid player you can see on social media he goes by the handle at freak underscore pancakes uh Tulsa is gonna hope that he can start racking those up as soon as he gets on campus, uh, big, big guy, big addition, uh, really good get by Tulsa to help improve that O-line. And now we're going to get to the last commit, and I know I'm going through these a little fast. I apologize for that, but I don't have too much to say on these. Next up, we have Navy grabbing another commit. They were up to the number 17 class. Uh, also, Tulsa, with those two commitments, now has the 12th best recruiting class so the AAC is making moves we've got four teams in the top 20 in recruiting class with Tulsa Navy EC, East Carolina and Tulane uh two of them in the two of them Navy and Tulane are in, in the top 10 so AAC is looking good recruiting wise um but here we got Dinesh Villegas sorry uh going to uh Navy 41% odds to go to Navy, 59% odds to go to Oregon, and Navy comes away with a steal, getting the offensive, getting the outside linebacker that they needed, that they've been looking to get for a while. Coverage guy, C overall, C plus potential, four stars out of Tomball, Texas, from Tomball Memorial High School. Uh, this is somebody who, you know, he's a coverage linebacker, and, uh, you know, he's he's got some good football IQ. He values academics, and... Well, he can be a little lazy at times, which is his biggest downside. Um, you know, this is a guy who can really play football and a guy who really can, despite the lazy work ethic, if you can get him on the field and if you can get him serious about practicing and about, you know, the next game, this is a guy who can be one of the best guys on the field at any given time, during any given game. So... Huge get. It's going to be a bit of a problem with his work th work ethic, but if they can find a way to get around that, this is a huge, huge addition by Navy. Um, as they continue to build their class, I keep talking about them building their class up. Um, I've never actually been able to pull up in the in their recruiting class, but I've got the rest of the recruiting class up here now. So they just brought in four star. They just brought in that four-star uh, outside linebacker, Dinesh Villegas. But let's take a look back at Navy's recruiting class so far. They started off really strong. Their first commitments, they got two the first week. that they, um, The first time, week of commitments for them, they got two guys from New Jersey committed the same week. That's Kyung Hee 
four-star pocket quarterback, B overall B plus potential, and Christopher Giles, four-star pass blocking offensive tackles, B overall C potential. You wait a little bit longer, then they get another two commitments. Four-star zone coverage, free safety, Bernard Wilson from Texas. So they got another Texas guy that Vilgas um, can, you know, get to know. Maybe somebody he's played against um, a couple of times. And four-star de uh, balanced defensive end from uh, Connecticut, Michael Harris. C overall, B potential. Uh, Bernard Wilson, I forgot if I said it. B overall, C plus potential. Then they got inside linebacker Timothy Johnson. He's a four-star run stopper talked about him recently on the last show i think that was last week from florida c overall c potential and kirk raglan four star re receiving running back from illinois c overall c plus potential adding another big name in villages to that class navy i mean doesn't have any four and five stars was not able to go after any five stars but despite not going get grabbing any five stars this is a team that's looked really good. They have seven guys in their recruiting class now. And like I said, no five stars, but they're still doing good enough where they're hanging in. And they're just a couple of points on the recruiting rankings outside of the top five. This is a team that's really making moves. Um, it is really looking good. Um, I'm going to try and find uh, Tulsa's abbreviation here uh, real quick. Uh, so I can pull up their class and we'll go over we'll we'll go over their class now um, Just to kind of catch you up and uh, Eventually, I'm gonna do something where we go over just the classes of the AAC um, But for now, we're just gonna look at these two classes um, I'm sorry, waiting for the bot to load. Okay, so it's not loading right now. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. Put Steam up there. Um, so yeah, Tulsa's class is not loading for me right now. So, unfortunately, um, there's no way. To, there's also no way to sort by, you know, which schools they committed to, which would be something that I would like, you know, to have in the future. But not too big of an ask, and not something I'm really looking for, you know, because that's after we get everything else, you know, ironed out, ironed out. So, not too worried about that. We will go over next week ne for next week's show. We will go over. Um, I'll get it all ready beforehand, and we will go over um, every AAC team's recruiting class to this point. Just talk about where they stand, um, because. Season's coming to a close, and this is going to be just a couple weeks of recruiting, and then classes are done. And camp starts. Fall camp starts for the next year. We're getting close. Teams are going to have are going to start, you know, filling up their classes soon. Um, we're going to start seeing a lot more commitments soon. So, you know, what we've seen here is like, you know, two, three commitments a week feel like in a couple weeks we're going to start seeing those numbers go up and we're going to see certain guys start flying to schools. Um, I know as Tulane I got a couple people that I've got my, that I've had my eye on for a while but just didn't have the points to go after and you know now that we're coming to the close now that we're coming to the end I got a couple more people that I got to focus on a little bit more but then but like I'm starting to spread my points out just to grab the rest of the guys on my board. Um, I've got a lot of guys that I've got my eyes on. I'm sure other teams do too. I'm sure that other teams are playing it the same way. So cannot wait to see more. Um, so I'm going to... It's 3.17 a.m. I'm going to have to cut the videos together. So I'll do that and then I'll have everything start doing it. And then when I wake up, I just have to press post on the video. Um, so I'll do that, and this will be out whenever I wake up tomorrow, or today, on Sunday. So, um, thank you for listening. Uh, again, like I said, first time, like I said earlier, first time with this mic, you know, not using, like, the filters I was using to make the mic sound better. So, if audio sounds a little bad, let me know. 
it's definitely something that I can go and I can fix on. Uh, but that's it. Um, sorry that I didn't get the first part out earlier. I apologize, but that's it for this week. Um, I cannot wait for next week. Things are really hit, heating up in the AAC. Not just, you know, getting to our games, but getting into recruiting. So, you know, just keep keep paying attention. I'm, I know others, and also keep paying attention to these other, these other conferences. I know I keep talking about the AAC, but SEC has a show. Tuscan Soda has a show. Um, and it's not just the AAC where things are heating up. Things are heating up everywhere. We're getting to the end of the season, so definitely go and give Ezeko and uh, Tuscan Soda's show a listen. They do a lot of good stuff, a lot better than me. But, uh, so yeah. And honestly, that's all I got for this week. So I'll see you guys next week. Um, I'm going to have to write up some Tulane media for later. So that's a little sneak peek for you. I'm just going to have to write up something about the Tulane one because I forgot I did that um, segment. But I'll see you guys uh, next week.